Hello everybody, today we're going to talk about a man named Juan Garcia, also known as Garbo the Spy, who in my opinion single-handedly won World War II for the Allies. We're going to break down everything from how he got into the spy ring to what he did during it, which is absolutely absurd, and talk about why he is an important and way too often overlooked person in human history. I'm really excited to talk about this. It's a cool topic. The stories are hard to imagine that they would even be made up, much less real. And it's evidence that sometimes truth definitely is stranger than fiction. Also, this video is similar to several in the past I've done that are about weird stories throughout history and that's something that I want to cover as much as possible on this channel. So I want to emphasize that a lot more because when it comes to learning about the people that came before us, I too struggle with losing interest in it from time to time and I want to help bring that back. And another thing that I seem to struggle with is editing. Like if you've noticed at this point, this channel is pretty low effort when it comes to the editing and if there's anything that requires skill, I just pass it on to Caitlin. But the worst possible way to edit is on a phone because the controls are always so minimal and there's not a lot of customization and you always end up with a subpar product. That is until Filmora Go. See, all the time I'll try to clip stuff for just short little videos and I'm like, oh, I can do this on my phone. And then using the majority of film editors, I can't do it at all and have to port it over to the computer and then report it and it's a whole process. See, Filmora Go is unique because it's an actual editing software that you can use on a mobile platform. And with unique options like the store on Filmora, you're able to buy literally thousands of different transitions and stickers on a site that updates frequently. Like for example, there are many unique filters that you can use on Filmora, including like this VHS overlay, which I'm a big fan of. So it's so much easier to, instead of using three different editing programs on my phone to put together one video, I finally have a one-stop shop for everything I need. Not only that, but just the seamless of being able to cut clips and videos and photos at the same time, as well as overlaying your filters and then combining it with unique transitions, make you feel like you're getting a real editing experience out of a mobile platform. So I invite you to go to the link in the description. There will be two links for either iOS or Android to download Filmora Go. So I encourage you all to either on the Google Play Store or the App Store, download Filmora and leave a review if you like it because it really is a great product that really makes the strain of editing on a phone so much easier. So thank you all so much for watching this ad. Thank you so much to Filmora for sponsoring this video. It means the most. I hope that you enjoy. I hope that you check it out and we are back to the video. We are going to go ahead and get into it, but as always, thank you for watching and thank you so much for getting me to half a million subscribers. I'll gush more about it at the end, um, but I'm really so thankful and I can't believe that you all have taken me this far and it means the most. So we're gonna talk about Garbo, but we'll get back to that. But thank you for watching. Juan Garcia was born on Valentine's Day of 1912 in Spain. He was born to a very conservative Catholic mother and a more socially liberal father that the upbringing sort of resulted in Juan being mostly rebellious. Like for example, Juan left school at the age of 16 because he got into a fight with a teacher and decided that he just didn't need school. From there, he did several odd jobs like he ran a cinema for a while and eventually got into learning animal husbandry. In 1931, he was forced to serve his compulsory six months in the Spanish military and he absolutely hated it. Like he was in the cavalry and also hated horses and the military itself, so it was a very rough time for Juan. However, his real troubles would come during the Spanish Civil War. Now I know the Spanish Civil War is much more complex than I'm about to make it, but there's a couple points I need to pull out of it in order to apply back to Juan himself, so I'm going to dumb it down a lot. There was essentially two sides to the war. There was the Spaniards who supported the nationalism and the fascist rule of the Spanish government. And then there was the Republic, which acted more as a sort of communist regime and wanted a more socialist change in the country. So it was chiefly a fascist vers versus socialist war against each other. In the early days of the war in 1936, 
Juan's sister and mother were arrested by the Republic, which I mentioned earlier was the socialist side, for being supposed counter-revolutionaries. At the time, the Republic army was essentially gathering resources and people to fight, and if you weren't in to help in some way, you were considered a traitor. So after his sister and mother got arrested, they then came for him, but he didn't want to enlist because, you know, Arresting your family kind of puts you at odds with whatever they're fighting for. So he was thrown in jail, but a week later broke out by revolutionaries because there was also a like, sort of revolutionary group going on at the time. And like I said, the real thing's pretty complicated. From there, he was given a fake ID that put his age as being too old to be drafted. So he does all that and then goes back to his home in which the farm he had, because remember he studied animal husbandry and was big on farming and chickens and all of that, had been repossessed by the Republic as a support to the cause, so all of his stuff had been taken in order to use for the war drive. From this, Juan grew to hate socialism. And the reason I emphasize that so much is because in a second, when we get to what happens in World War II, these events are what define the person he became later. So, he joins the Republic Army just so he can put together this elaborate plan to defect over to the fascist side just so he can fight against the Republic. So Juan, out of sheer pettiness, joins the Republic Army, becomes a telegraph lineman. In other words, they have to run the actual lines back and forth across a battlefield. And during the first battle he was in, he got really close to the enemy lines and then ran across, surrendered, and said he wanted to join them. However, as soon as he was taken in by the nationalist side, he was immediately beat and thrown in jail because they didn't believe he actually supported the cause. Which, true, he didn't. He just wanted to fight the Republic, but, you know. It was while being in prison that he realized the ideas of the fascist were also bad and that they wanted, like, full supremacy and to fight people that disagreed with him. And he really grew to hate the idea of one group of people killing another for their political ideas and you can see where this is going. However, through all of that, he fought on both sides of a war without firing a single bullet, which is going to be very poetically ironic in a minute. So two years after the Spanish Civil War was over and he was released and returned home with his family, he now had a wife and a son, and then all of a sudden, a group nearby in Europe called the National Socialist Party, also known as the Nazi Party, starts making trouble. And if you'll remember the points I highlighted, if there were two things Juan hated, it was nationalism and socialism. So he was not happy at all. So for no other reason than the fact that he just hated them, he decided to become a British spy. See, at the time in 1940, um, America hadn't entered the war yet and the war was just starting to get rolled out. So he didn't have a whole plethora of options of what part of the Allies to join. It was pretty much Britain and Germany. So he decides to become a spy for Britain. He went to the British embassy in Madrid three times asking to be a spy and every time they turned him down. Which, to the embassy's credit, I mean, you're in the middle of a war of intelligence and then a guy from a neutral zone's like, hey, you should... Let me learn all about Britain's secrets so I can totally help them beat the Nazis and no other reason. So Juan decides, if I can't help Britain defeat Germany, then I'm going to troll Germany so hard that they defeat themselves and that's exactly what he did. He then changed gears and told Germany that he wanted to be a spy for them. He made up a whole story that he was a pro-Nazi politician in Spain who was getting ready to travel to London on a diplomatic mission. To prove this, he went to a register in Lisbon, said that he worked for the embassy back in Madrid, and they just took his word for it and printed him a diplomatic passport. So all he had to do was mail that over to Germany and say, see, I'm a politician. And they're like, this guy's pretty legit. I mean, he's got the passport. So Germany sent an actual Nazi spy to meet and vet him. And the spy decided that Juan was the real deal. The real spy gave Juan lessons about how Germany hides things like wires and gets information, as well as giving him a bottle of invisible ink, a code book full of German codes, and 600 pounds in money 
in order to finance his trip to London. Or at least things that he may need to buy, you know, in a super secret spy fashion while in London because they thought he was being sent there by the Spanish government. His objective was to go to Britain and then make a network out of British agents who are sympathetic to Germany in order to make an infiltration bed within London. Instead, my man Juan went to Lisbon and simply bought a bunch of British newspapers and read a bunch of recent British books about what it's like to live in London and then wrote a bunch of letters pretending that he was in London. Like, I want you to process this in your brain. Germany thinks that he is in London working as a spy for Germany, when actually he's in Spain reading newspapers like, huh, there's a fair in Glasgow on Saturday. There is a fair in Glasgow and he sends it. So then Germany gets a British paper and they're like, He's right. <laughs> he did this with renter's expenses by simply looking in rental property listings. He did this with memoirs about what it's like to live in London, to talk about how crowds move in the city circle and things like that. And he even got around some hiccups. Like for example, he didn't understand how the British money system worked because it was like, you know, pounds. And then beneath that you had like the 120th of a pound or whatever and he didn't really get the whole process of how it worked so he would just kind of give these general words like in his expenses he would write i had to buy uh, food at a restaurant it was like around six pounds i don't know i'll figure it out later <laughs> and just always said that at the end of the war he'll figure out how much it actually cost and germany was admirable that he wasn't caring about the money and instead his mission <laughs> so his job was to find a bunch of spies in britain to work for germany so that's exactly what he did. He started just making up people, saying, oh, I met a Mr. John Doe today, and talking about what he's like, why he's supportive of Germany, and all the different ways he's trying to radicalize people. So Germany started putting together this big dossier of all of his accomplices, which is actually just one man living alone at a library in Spain, pretending to be a German spy networking with other German spies in London. He was sending so many of these transmissions that the British MI5, which is essentially their counterintelligence, or at least that's how it operated during the war, picked up on some of his messages going through and thought they were from an actual German spy in London. So they started a whole manhunt through London trying to find him. When I stress again, he's actually in Spain just like trolling the Germans. This went on for a year with Germany thinking that they had a Spanish politician who was working his way through the upper echelon of British government and building a network of spies that didn't actually exist. And with Britain looking for him, also believing him to be a politician in London, building a network of spies that don't exist. Eventually the US got involved in the war. So whenever the US came to Spain, he tried again because remember Britain turned him down three separate times for being a spy. So one day Juan just casually walks into the American outpost set up in Lisbon and is like, hey, I've been a spy for the Germans for like a year now. <laughs> and he showed the Americans all this information that he had done where he just like got the Germans to chase their tail on a bunch of occasions. And like, I'm not kidding. Juan was literally just making stuff up and the Germans believed him. Like one time he said something along the lines of, hey, in France, there's like a big convoy of British troops somewhere around this general area. Uh, be on the lookout for that. So Germany spent like two weeks hunting through the forest and like never found them because he was just sending them on a dog chase because he thought it was funny. And whenever they message him and they're like, hey, there is no one here, he's like, they got away. <laughs> so whenever he shows all this information and especially how much Germany trust him to the Americans, they were like, what? why didn't Britain say yes to this guy? He's a mastermind. So after America basically plays intermediate for him with Britain, he's immediately accepted into the MI6 spy program, which I love so much that without ever technically being a real spy at all, he just took it on himself to simply annoy the German military 
because he hated them so much. So in April of 1942, Juan and his family were officially moved to London, the city he pretended to live in for a year, and he officially became a double agent. It was at this time he was given the code name of Garbo after the Spanish actress Greta Garbo because they said he was such a fabulous actor all this time that it was such a fitting name. In the early days of this, him as well as a team they put together for him within MI6 wrote 315 letters to Germany pretending to be Garbo still as a German spy, as well as his developing network of sub-spies. Germany was so convinced by this, they quit recruiting new spies because they believed Garbo was doing so incredibly well there was no need to get further spies. The way he managed to maintain this reputation even after becoming a true double agent is that he always either gave fake info, unimportant info, or really good info that was purposefully delayed. Like for example, he would send Germany a perfect one-to-one -one scale of what life is like in London when the trains run, when the boats come in and out, and things like that, which didn't matter but proved his reputation with the Germans. Because then, anytime they cross-reference him to make sure he's telling the truth, he is, and that makes him look reputable. The fake info was always given under the misdirection that he had actionable knowledge of what was going to happen. For example, if there was a troop movement of the British at a certain part in Europe and he was off by a little bit, he would simply blame it on one of his sub-spies and that he got confused with directions. Because remember, he was like the big guy, or at least the Germans thought, and he had all of these workers going out and doing spy work for him. So if he ever got information wrong, he could just be like, oh, you know, Dave, he... Forgot to wear his watch again. <laughs> One of the best examples of this was before Operation Torch, which occurred in Africa. Basically what it was is Britain had a fleet of warships that left from Britain and then went and attacked along the coast of Africa and fought the Germans. Garbo wrote a letter saying that he witnessed a bunch of British warships that were all painted in Mediterranean camo leave the port in Britain. He dated the letter for a few days before the battle began. However, they purposefully held on to the letter a week and then sent it so whenever Germany got it, they were like, oh man, if this would have came in earlier, we would have known. <laughs> to which they replied to that letter and said, we are sorry the arrived too late, but your last reports were magnificent. So Germany decided that Garbo was far too important of an asset in order to trust like letter delivery through and things that could take a while. So they sent him a massive code machine and radio operation system. And it's really funny because at the time, they think he's like living like secretly in London. So they deliver it real quietly through the canals or whatever. And then whenever it gets to like the British headquarters, they're like, all right, here's the secret German Enigma code. We'll just <laughs> set this up in the office. To which they made up a whole alias for a fake radio operator, which Garbo played. So it's pretty much Garbo going up to the mic and being like, y y yes, this is um, uh, John, uh, not, not the, the, the agent. <laughs> So now they couldn't really rely on letters being late because it was radio transmissions and other than going through a code system, it was immediate. So then he had to start making up lies for why agents weren't able to warn Germany about things that happened. For example, there was one battle in which a fleet of ships left Liverpool and attacked the Germans. And then someone at the German command pointed out that one of Garbo's operators is supposed to be living in Liverpool. So why didn't he know a whole fleet of ships left from there? So Garbo made up a whole story that this guy that doesn't actually exist got sick and he's laid up in the hospital right now and that's why he didn't see the ships leave. He even carried this story out over a couple weeks and eventually said that that guy died to which the British government made a obituary in the paper that day for a guy who didn't really exist just so Garbo could send a copy of it to Germany and say, look, here, he died. To which Germany was so bereaved that one of their agents had died that they sent condolences <laughs> and a large pension to a supposed widow that, again, doesn't exist. Which I don't know where that money went, but I imagine that, like, it went to Garbo or his wife 
And he was like, the family appreciates the kind offer. <laughs> it was also around this time Germany decided that if anyone needs to be kept at the top of security, it's Garbo. So they sent him the highest level Enigma machine that they had created in Germany, as well as all of their up-to-date codes and systems. So all that had to happen was they were sending their top secret code information to someone working in British headquarters. <laughs> so all Britain had to do in order to code break was walk over to Garbo's desk and be like, hey, did they send those new codes they just updated? And Garbo's like, oh yeah, here you go. And boom, code broken. <laughs> the reason that I'm okay with saying he single-handedly won World War II is because of what happened in 1944. See, Germany told Garbo in January that they feared an allied invasion of Europe was soon to take place. This later became known as Operation Overlord, which is the assault that D day is from. So Garbo became part of something known as Operation Fortitude, which was an entire operation that was just to keep D-Day a secret. Between January and June 6th, which was the day that D-Day occurred, Garbo communicated 500 messages to the German radio operator, sometimes doing up to 20 a day. See, the Allies had planned that it would be best whenever they hit Omaha Beach for the Germans to think that they were coming in at the Strait of Dover. So to keep some credibility in the months leading up to this, Garbo would trickle certain information through, like he believes the Americans are gonna be the primary ones pushing forward. And also there's a lot of chatter that it's gonna be along the North Shore of France. Basically enough to keep the Germans believing him, but not enough to actually give up what they were planning. On the actual night before D-Day, which occurred in the early morning hours of June the 6th, so on the evening of June the 5th into the very early morning hours of June 6th, the plan was Garbo was going to contact Germany. He was going to talk to them and give them some pretty good details, but not perfect details of what was to happen. The story that he set up with Germany the day before is that late tonight, I have a sub agent coming in who knows everything. So as soon as he gets here, I'll tell you all what he tells me about the Allied invasion. However, he sends this message at three in the morning and Germany doesn't respond. As a matter of fact, they didn't respond until after D-Day took place. See, Americans hit the beach at 6.30 a.m. and around 8 a.m. Germany got back on the line and was like, oh, we're so sorry, we missed your call. So now that D-Day was over, Garbo gave them 100% perfect information. He told the Germans that he knew the Allies were gonna hit Omaha Beach and they were gonna do it at 6.30 and they need reinforcements there and blah, blah, blah. And he played this roll up so much that Garbo got mad at the German operators for not taking the war seriously. He even said to the operator he was yelling at, I cannot accept excuses or negligence. Were it not for my ideas, I would abandon this work. So at this point, Germany thinks that Garbo had 100% perfect information about the Allied assault and they simply didn't answer him. So from this point on, they treated Garbo like he was a high-ranking general. Three days after D-Day, Garbo told them about this entire diversion plan that was put together by the Allies. See, for those that don't know, D-Day was a very risky move. For one, they expected a lot of people to die, and even though a lot did, it wasn't near the number they accounted for. And it is also a very narrow beach, and it was the only port into Europe. So it took months for enough troops to get on the beach at Normandy and push into France for there to actually be a effort there in the country. So what that pretty much means is that Germany had to be distracted long enough to get allied supplies into France. So there was this whole diversion plan set up. See, General Patton was known for being a very famous American general. So with the help of Garbo, they set up this diversion. Supposedly, Patton was stationed on the south banks of England with about 150,000 soldiers, tanks, airplanes, radios, and everything else needed in order to launch a full-scale invasion much, much larger than the invasion at Normandy. In actuality, it was Patton, about 20 guys, and inflatable tanks with fake airplanes. And the inflatable tanks were even invented by a magician who did it as part of an illusion act. The whole point was that if a German plane flies overhead, it looks like tanks and planes from the sky, when in actuality, it's entirely a diversion thing. So Garbo gets on the radio with Germany and says he's not sure what's going on, but General Patton 
as well as 150,000 men and armor and aircraft are still on the banks of England. And there's probably going to be an even bigger invasion. This message was sent directly to Adolf Hitler, who said they needed to act on it immediately. So they send possibly the best German general of the war, Erwin Rommel, to the shore opposite, expecting it to be a huge showdown between General Patton and Erwin Rommel. And every day, Garbo would get back on the radio and say any day they're gonna invade and they just need to sit tight and wait. All of these German forces, as well as so many high commanders stationed way away from Normandy, ready for a second invasion that doesn't actually exist, allowed enough time for the Allies to get supplies in and continue the war in Europe. To Erwin Rommel's credit, he called BS on it, but the higher military order wouldn't let him leave that beach. They stayed there for two months and never fully pulled troop presence from the area. As a matter of fact, two months after D-Day, there were more soldiers waiting on this fake invasion on a random beach than there were German soldiers actually at D-Day. It was during this time in July of 1944 that Adolf Hitler personally signed to give Garbo the Iron Cross, which is the highest possible award that you can earn in the German military. It's the equivalent of the Medal of Honor in the United States. This was given to him over radio because they said the advice that he was giving them about General Patton's army was going to single-handedly save the war, which, oh boy, were they right just about the other team. After this, his word was considered so sacred that whenever the war was over and people were combing over German files, 62 of Garbo's reports were directly listed in the high command German's like war room or essentially the room where Hitler and the other generals would meet and discuss battle plans. 62 times they listed Garbo as a source. This whole charade had to come to a semi end when near the end of the war, Germany began launching V1 rockets into Britain. So they then asked Garbo if he can, for one, give them reports about how the rockets did and two, give them new targets to pick out. This was a tricky situation because for one, he doesn't want to tell them the rockets are working or not working because if he says they are working, they'll keep bombing. And if he says they're not working, then they can probably just send an overhead plane to look and see that they are and figure out that he's a traitor. And then as far as giving targets, he didn't want to be like, oh no, don't bomb that school bomb this other school. <laughs> so him and the British government set up this entire fake ruse that he had been arrested and therefore wasn't allowed back in London. The story was the Briton expected him of being a Nazi spy, so they arrested him. He then got released and issued an apology by the British government. So the British government wrote up a fake apology and he passed it off to Germany and was like, see here, they said that I'm a spy and I can't go back to London. So sorry, I guess I can't tell you how the rockets are doing. And he spent the rest of the war pretending to send the messages as a sort of fugitive around the country of Britain, while in actuality, he had never left the desk in British headquarters. <laughs> and by the time the war was over, they had given him the equivalent of 340,000 US dollars for the supposed 27 agents he had under his command. And at the end of the war, he was awarded the most excellent order of the British Empire, which is the highest military order you can receive in Britain. And because while the Nazi party was in effect, they never figured out he was a spy, so they never went back on the Iron Cross they had given him, making him, to my knowledge, the only person who ever won the highest medal of merit on both sides of a single war. So after the war, he got a little concerned that, you know, some former Nazis or Germans may want to have a few words with him. So he faked his death and moved to Venezuela in 1949. From there, he opened up a bookstore and ran a gift shop and just lived a quiet life with his wife and kid. And we may never have known the story past that or what happened in 1949 if it wasn't for 1971 when a British politician really wanted to find this guy. It's a long story how he went on a whole manhunt, but it ended with him getting a phone book in Barcelona, Spain and calling every single person listed as Jay Garcia. Eventually, because I imagine there's a lot of Jay Garcias in Barcelona, he eventually got into contact with 
Juan or Garbo's nephew and he told him where Garbo was. And in 1984, the two of them met and the politician convinced him to come back to Britain for a while. So while in Britain, Prince Philip met him and brought him to the castle in which he was given a very long audience with the queen. And then he went to D-Day on the 40th anniversary and looked at the graves and paid respect to a battlefield that in my opinion, he kept a lot less names from showing up on those tombstones. And then after that, he simply retired back home and died with his family of natural causes in 1988. And that is effectively the story of Garbo the Spy. And I, for one, think this may be one of the most underrated guys in history. There are several historians who hold on to the idea that if it had not been for the Allied invasion at D-Day, then the Allies would never have won the war and that would have been the end of it. So if that's believed to be true, then none of it at all was possible without Garbo. If even the Allies managed to hit the shores and get up the beaches without the Germans thinking that the assault was happening somewhere else, then definitely they would have cut out the supply route that was being made if it wasn't for Garbo telling them that they had to prepare for a fake invasion that never really occurred. Uh, and it's so funny that it all came from someone who wasn't an American fighter, wasn't a British fighter. He was just a guy from Spain who really hated the Nazis. And then after the war was over, he didn't bask in the money or the wealth or the glory or whatever. He just lived a quiet life with his family in Venezuela. And I really love the story of him. And there's like, there's never been a movie made about him. There's like documentaries and things like that. And personally, I don't know if a movie would work because I could see a studio wanting to make this like way too serious and make it some like Turing test kind of super mind game movie. When in actuality, I think you need to like, as a dark comedy, embrace the humor in it. How wild it is that just a guy pretty much out of sheer pettiness managed to cripple the Nazi empire to the point where Hitler considered him one of their most valuable operators. Um, and it's just a really cool story and I really enjoyed it. And I hope that you enjoyed it as well. And I hope maybe now a few more people out there know the name of Garbo the Spy or Juan Garcia because he definitely deserves it. So thank you all so much for watching. I hope that you enjoyed. I hope that this wasn't boring. Like I said, I love weird history, especially history like this. Um, and it means the most that you're watching and it means the most that we are now at half a million subscribers, a number that I never thought possible. I never thought I'd get here. Um, and it still just doesn't seem real to me, but you guys are fantastic and beyond what I can imagine. Um, and I'm truly blessed to have you all and just half, half a million. It's, it's not real. It hasn't hit me yet. <laughs> I don't know if it ever will. Uh, but thank you all so much for that. It means the most. So hopefully we'll see where we go from here. Hopefully we, we just keep moving up and it's all thanks to you guys. Uh, and I greatly appreciate it. So thank you all so much for watching. There'll be more icebergs and I'm going to get to tier nine soon. Don't worry. It's coming up. Uh, there's a lot to research with that, but um, I hope that you enjoyed. Uh, I hope that you liked this video. I hope to see you in the next one, um, but that will do it for this. So I hope you have a good day and I will see you in the next one.